Welcome to the Ghostly Broadcast Station. I am your host, Timothy. Broadcasting from my farm where the ghastly and unusual grows from the soil. Hoteliers and the places they offer are meant to offer us refuge in a place that's unknown to us. We rely on them to provide us with shelter and comfort during our stays in unfamiliar places. But what happens when that unspoken social contract is broken? What can we do when we're all alone, fending for ourselves when the roof over our heads isn't safe anymore? Well, tonight we'll find out from these four contributors who have shared their stories. So listen in and maybe be more considerate when selecting your accommodation the next time you leave home. Our first story. Dear Timothy, I'm Emily and I was recently in Barcelona for a friend's destination wedding. I was short on cash and didn't want to fork out to stay in the hotel where the reception was hosted and most of the guests were staying, so I booked an Airbnb. A couple that owned the apartment lived right next door. They greeted me and said I could knock any time if I needed anything. Even a little hamper of food and drink was left out as a welcome gift. I was only staying for three nights, but after meeting the bride-to-be and the bridesmaids out in town, I came back, showered, and settled in. I was watching some Netflix crap on my laptop over a nightcap of wine when I heard some horrendous arguing from next door. They were screaming at each other in Spanish, so I had no idea what was being said, but it was very heated. I heard a lot of crying from the woman. The following day, I was up early to get ready. Clad in makeup and sweatpants, I headed out with my dress over my shoulder. Just as I stepped out, I saw the woman leaving as well. She looked disheveled and carrying what looked like a hastily packed suitcase. Figuring that they must have had a marriage-ending fight last night, I was not about to get involved in any of it. She looked at me. She was shocked at first, then she looked sad. She told me that she was sorry and I said it was okay. I didn't feel like she had to be sorry to me if she was only referring to the shouting, but at least at that point, I didn't know what she was really sorry about. The wedding went well and I was home late. I passed out instantly after hitting the pillow. Following day, I would relax, nurse a hangover, and meet a few friends for brunch. When I eventually dragged my drunk self out of bed, I staggered to the shower. Barcelona is hot in the summer, especially for Brits like me, so I'd spent most of my time in the apartment sleeping and walking around topless, unless I had the curtains open. When I walked into the bathroom, I slipped on a wet tile, and being still pretty drunk, I flailed about like an idiot before landing into the plaster on the wall, which my elbow knocked a massive hole into. Naturally, I was immediately panicking. I'd now have to add a repair bill to the couple's marital woes and be out of pocket for damaging the place. That was until I saw the wire. The wire looked odd being in a bathroom without any main outlets. Curiosity got the better of me, and I traced it up to the ceiling and along to a small vent above the shower. At first, it seemed innocuous enough. Then I saw the faint glint of glass. A closer inspection revealed a little lens poking through the slats in the vent. Suddenly, I was aware of my body and scrambled to put a towel around me. I felt sick, ashamed, and embarrassed. I ran to the bedroom to get dressed, but right before I dropped the towel, I stopped and started looking around the room for more cameras. Eventually, I just got into the closet and awkwardly dressed inside it. I packed my stuff and left. I bumped into the man as I was heading out. He asked me if I was going, and I made an excuse about returning to work early. When I met my friends, I told them everything. They said I needed to go straight to the police. It took a while to convince the police that it was worth investigating until they contacted the guy's wife. Thankfully, she was more than willing to bury her husband after discovering what he'd been up to. 
the police seized thousands of pictures he'd been selling online. There were cameras everywhere in that place. It was horrifying. Now I only book hotels and never use Airbnb again. I got my money back for the ordeal, but was still scarred by the whole thing. Even now, if I'm in a hotel, I'm conscious about getting undressed. Yours sincerely, Emily. Our second story. Hi, Timothy. I'm Marie, and I hope my story will fall into your expertise. Collective dreams, hallucinations, or nightmares weren't exactly something I believed in before. Not long ago, me and my friends were on a trip to Nice for Bastille Day. We'd made a whole plan of it and decided to get an Airbnb together. It was a way for us all to relax together and enjoy the festivities. The place was gorgeous. A big, multi-bedroom manor on the city's outskirts with a garden pool and a room for each of us. We all arrived in ones and twos over the evening and settled into catching up, drinking too much wine and having fun. One by one, we eventually turned in for the night. I know that staying in unfamiliar places can take its toll on the mind. Especially when you've had one glass too many, I tossed and turned that night until I eventually managed to sleep. I don't recall how long it took me, but I remember the worst nightmare. I vividly remember the house we were staying at. A man was trying to break in and kill us all, me and my friends. He entered the manor and killed us off one at a time. It was as if I'd had a false awakening during the night, because as soon as the man caught me, I felt the cold knife plunge into my flesh. I screamed and woke myself up. Feeling a little worse for wear, I was relieved it was just a terrible dream, but that wasn't the end. Downstairs we were all emerging for breakfast, and someone already had a pot of coffee ready. I explained that I had an awful dream. Someone broke in with a knife and tried to kill us. Another one of my friends looked ashen over her coffee. She looked me dead in the eyes and told me she'd had the same dream in this house. Some of our friends hadn't, as they'd just passed out drunkenly and couldn't remember a thing, but four of us had all had the same dream. All from our own perspectives, all of them ended the same way. We all felt very unsettled after that, and we had two more nights to stay there. Thankfully, the rest of our stay went off without incident. Still. Even after a good day at the parade, we all felt a little better staying up with each other in the living room instead of going to bed. Even if I felt stiff and sore from sleeping on a sofa, it just made us feel safer. I don't know if we all saw some potential future or lived some kind of collective incident of the past, but whatever happened was strange and unsettling. We all saw and felt the same thing in our dreams. You and your listeners may have some answers. Maybe it'll just leave more questions. Kind regards, Marie. Our third story. Dear Timothy, I'm Paul, and I've traveled much of Europe with my wife, Michelle, and our friends, Brian and Sharon. The four of us have always taken trips together and explored the continent when we got the chance. A few years ago, we decided to find a nice little place to rent on the outskirts of Milan to enjoy a bit of the North Italian countryside. Michelle and I were the first ones to arrive at this beautiful villa. It had acres of land to explore, and due to a little scheduling issue, it would just be the two of us for the first night. Being in such a large villa was daunting, and not what we were used to, but I was determined for us to make the most of it. We cracked open some wine and cooked ourselves a fine meal. Things started getting weird when we settled on the sofa to watch a movie. Obviously, when you don't know a place, you have difficulty finding where all the light switches are and which ones are for what. But both of us had been finding it a bit difficult throughout the evening as it got darker. 
Sometimes I would turn on one switch, and another light would turn on somewhere else. Shell would flick a switch I had just pressed, and a completely different light would turn on or off than the one that had switched when I pressed it. I'd sat down to watch the movie when we both realized the kitchen light was still on. So, being the gentleman I am, I got up to turn it off. That's when both of us noticed the issue at the same time. Michelle piped up that the switch I went for was for something other than the kitchen. I disagreed and flicked it anyway. It turned off the kitchen light, but the living room light came on. Have you been having issues with these lights as well? I asked her, and she said that she'd noticed it too. All of the lights in the house seemed to have a mind of their own. I flicked a few more until the living room light went out and moved to sit back down with my wife. That's when she pointed out that a hallway light was on now. I sighed and got back up, but then a light switch clicked. All of the lights went off. Neither I nor Michelle had been anywhere near any switches. I turned on my phone torch and carefully walked over to the switches. None of them were working. I reassured Michelle that it must be faulty wiring and then wondered out loud where the fuse box was. As I moved through the house, things started to take a turn. Lights would come on, lights would go off. Some flashed so hard that they burnt out. I heard Michelle scream, but the house was pitch black. When I found the fuse box, nothing seemed suspect. Everything was in the on position, but the lights in the house were going crazy. The TV was blaring static, and the microwave and oven went off. My wife was beside herself. I turned every circuit breaker to the off position, and everything went quiet. I made my way back to my poor wife by the light of my phone torch. She asked me what it was, and I told her I didn't know. I wondered if it was someone playing a cruel prank. I called the owner, but no one answered, probably because it was so late. I called a hotel in Milan and asked if they had a room for the night. We packed up, got in the car, and left. Neither of us wanted to stay there anymore. We called Brian and Sharon and told them the Airbnb was a bust. The following day, we were sitting at the breakfast buffet of the three-star family package hotel in Milan that had a room for the night and tried to discuss what to do. Just as we looked up similar villa listings on our phone, one of the waiters leaned over and interjected. He pointed right at the listing for the villa we'd left the night before and told us that we should avoid that one. As it turns out, the guy who built it was a wealthy architect. He designed it for his own personal security as well as for more nefarious things. After one missing person too many, he was eventually caught with a girl locked in there and bodies buried all over the grounds. He'd been using his home as some kind of sick funhouse to torture his victims. Although he was long gone and the house is now a rental, I wonder how many of his little traps still lie there. Yours sincerely, Paul. Our fourth story. Dear Timothy, Do you ever hear about those times when people book an Airbnb? They arrive and find out that the letter booked multiple people to stay simultaneously? It's awkward, right? Well, I've got a hell of a story for you. I was in town for the EDM season. Some of the best players were in town, and I was gonna meet up with my friends from uni at the clubs. I found myself a quiet apartment, out of the way, where I could just post up and sleep the day away. I was the first one to get there. I say first, but I wasn't aware of what was about to happen at the time. An hour or so into my stay, while I'm getting ready for the night, some guy just lets himself in while I'm in the bathroom. After some shocked introductions, he explained that he rented the place for a week and booked it a month ago. When we both tried to get in touch with the letter, neither of us got an answer. Interestingly, they were both different letters, but were renting out the same address. 
not 15 minutes later, a young couple comes walking in, bags in tow and a fresh pair of wedding rings on their fingers. The two were city hopping through Europe and Berlin was one of their stops for a few days. When the next group showed up, three dudes who were also here for Berlin's ADM scene, everyone started getting pissed off. It was a one-bedroom apartment and now seven people inside had all paid a different person to rent the place. We all peacefully agreed to sit down, get comfy, and wait until we could sort this out with whoever actually owned the place. Two hours later, I was late to meet my friends but unwilling to leave the only place I had to stay. Then the fire alarm went off. I was closest to the front door, but it wouldn't budge. One of the bigger, burly dudes from the group of three friends tried, but it was solid. I remember being amazed at how quickly the place filled with smoke. I was terrified, and the seven of us, all strangers, were now trapped in a burning building. The newlywed husband rushed to the door, but burnt all the skin from his hand when he grabbed the handle. The heat was coming from right in front of the door. Panic set into all of us. As I started to feel the thick smoke in my lungs, I began to panic for air. I grabbed a bar stool from the breakfast bar and ran for the window. I remembered to hit the corners of the window to break the double glazing and smashed as hard as my weak arms could. One of the guys helped me with the stool and we swung it like a battering ram. After a few hits in the third corner, the window fell free and shattered on the pavement four stories below. We screamed as loud as we could for help. Thankfully, the burning building had already attracted attention. We were laddered out of there, not a moment too soon. They caught the guy who had organized our multiple bookings a few weeks later. The man was an arsonist who had graduated to murder. That night he wanted to burn as many of his first human victims as possible. We got lucky that he'd left a trace for the police to follow online. I'm still never using Airbnb again. I don't know what measures they have to protect people, but they obviously don't work. It was months before I could get back to work. Physically, I recovered just fine, but mentally, the thought of being trapped again with fire all around me, it was all too much. Yours, Harriet. Well, dear listener, Will you reconsider your own travel plans the next time you venture out into the unknown? Perhaps you may want to think more carefully about the places where you make your temporary dwelling. Whatever you do, stay safe out there. If you enjoy the tales of haunting, unsettling, and disturbing occurrences. Stories that abide in a space of dark curiosity that dare you to cross the threshold of their shadows then consider a like and subscribe. Until next time, I've been Timothy, broadcasting into the night from my farm.